Well, first of all, I want to thank every one of you for listening in to today for this discussion that we're going to be having. Universal Accounting Center is excited to be able to host and offer this opportunity to discuss really some creative ways to manage and structure your businesses and also protect your assets. Now, one of the things I'd like to do is introduce myself. This is Roger Connect, president of Universal Accounting Center, and I'm here with Ron. Ron Haycock happens to be the presenter today that's going to share his insights as how, how to strategically and proactively protect your assets. And on the line, we also have Doug Hales, CPA, and Marvin Crowther. So thank you for all being with us today. And Ron, I look forward, look forward to the presentation. I've seen this. I've actually discussed this with you a number of times. But here in the next uh, 50 minutes, we intend to kind of get the nuances of it all. So I look forward to your insights. Thank you, Roger. I appreciate that. My question is at the very beginning, how many jokes do I get to tell? You can tell as many as you'd like, as long as you understand there's only three individuals you're going to hear laugh. So if it goes too silent, it's not because of the, the audience. It's only because of the, uh, the voices you hear. So there you go. And for those of you who will be listening later on, these are for you as well. Right? <laughs> Good. Now, this first page is for Pat, Pat Lafayette Corporation. We're management accountants. We have a staff of, of eight people, and what we're trying to do is to help individuals that are in business for themselves understand how to organize themselves, why to organize themselves, how to get structured, the differences in the structure. But in today's seminar, we're not going to be able to go through every detailed amount. So of course, obviously, we're looking at what can we do to structure ourselves as a business correctly. So obviously, there's different structures that we can be considering as, as we're starting or building our businesses. But you're going to get more into how to do this in a proactive, kind of a tax structured, sheltered kind of a approach. That is correct. All right. Well, I look forward to this. Let's get started. All right. From the first page, you can see who's inv invited with us. And so, in fact, we have um, Doug Hales. You can see his name. is He's our staff CPA. He is the owner of Accounting First. And then we have the, our tax accountant, who is Marvin Crowther, worked for the IRS for nine years. And he is our main tax accountant, takes care of all of our clients, and can answer most of our IRS questions. So it's nice to have both of them with us and both of helping us on this year. Um, this is our affiliation. We belong to the National Society of Accountants. Uh, in addition to being a management accountant, I'm also a, a member of the American College of Forensic Examiners, which means that I can do forensic auditing. And I, I specialize, my forensic auditing, I specialize in is mortgage auditing because I was in the mortgage industry since 1977. And then, of course, Roger, we have your business here, Universal Accounting, and I'm a, I'm a mentor with the BYU Management Society. Now, the name of the class is Business Organization. And I taught this for several years, but I didn't really like the name Business Organization, so I found a phrase by John Rockefeller. The name of the phrase is, own nothing and control everything. The question is, how do we do that? Now, right at the very beginning, I want to tell you something, and I want to give you this as strong advice. Never avoid to pay your taxes. That's really important. I'm not here to tell you how to avoid it. None of us want you to do it. We want you to pay your, your fair share. But you have the right to do tax planning, and you should always receive professional advice. Is that not true, Doug? Yes, that's absolutely true. And one of the things that we want to do is introduce Doug because – if there's things I don't know, and I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know a lot of things, but Doug does. Doug, Doug is our expert, and we, we appreciate him being with us. We also have the right, all of us, to know what deductions are allowed by the IRS. We want you to take advantage of every deduction you can that's allowed by law. Now the question again, how do you own nothing and control everything? The first step is, you need to know why you want to be in business. Why is it you want to have your own business? And there's a lot of different people out there with different ideas, don't you think, Roger? Oh, yeah. I think everyone has something that they're an expert in and they're good at. And I think uh, one of the things that Gerber says in his book, E-Myth, is every technician can kind of go through that experience of wanting to now own their own business. They think, well, I'm doing it now. Why not get paid like the owner, right? <laughs> so they have that entrepreneurial seizure and they go out and start their business. So I understand that. They have a niche, they have a specialty, and they want to get paid right for it. So how many people have you asked that question? Of, of what? How, how much, who, what they want to, why do they want to be in business? Oh, anyone that's in business. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, have you ever talked to any of your clients and, want, and asked them why they wanted to be in their own business? 
Uh, yes, I have. Yeah. And most of them want the, 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 the most common is they want to be, want the flexibility to do what they want. That's exactly correct. So the reason that most people want, and these are the two top reasons. The first is that they like independence and autonomy. They like to be their own boss. They don't like working for other people for the most part. Entrepreneurs are a special breed of individuals. And we like entrepreneurs. The second thing is that they don't want to tell anybody else, tell them how much they can earn. So they want to increase their earnings based on their will, work, and their skills. But I believe that there are two more reasons for owning your own business that's really a critical. The first is, if you have a properly organized business and do it correctly, you can reduce your tax liability. Now, Doug and I yesterday were talking to a young man who's starting his own business, and he was asking about what kind of write-offs he can have for research. We had another client do this, and he came in and had paid $25,000 over a year's period of time to research a business. The IRS disallowed those $25,000 because they considered him a hobby business, which we'll go to get into. But he was considered that because he was not formally organized. If you formally organize your business and do it correctly, your business is your best tax reduction uh, vehicle. And the last reason, I think, and the most important reason is that you protect your family, yourself, and your assets. So make sure you're organized properly. If you're not, you lose protection, you lose a lot of benefits. Now let's talk about a hobby business. And one of the things that I have with me today is a letter from a, a tax institute called the Bradford Tax Institute. And it says that basically that hobby businesses are under attack. The IRS doesn't like hobby businesses. That's why the, this one individual was disallowed $25,000 in deductions because he was not organized. He worked out of his house. He did the travel. He didn't have any idea. He, he wasn't trying to make a profit. If the IRS is going to allow you to take tax deductions, you need to be in business to make a profit. You need to have a profit motive. So do not be a hobby business. And we have that available for you to read if you want to do so at the end of this seminar. Now let's talk about how you pay your money and how you get your, your, your taxes taken care of. First off, you as an employee, let's say you're a W-2 employee. You earn your income, and we're gonna assume that you make $5,000 a month. You pay your taxes, 15% is a, it's about an average tax bracket. Then you pay, after your taxes, you pay your fixed expenses at home, your house payment, your car payment, your credit card payments, your utility payments, um, probably your food, but that's not really a, a fixed expense. But the expenses that you can't do away with, otherwise everything gets shut down. And then after your expenses, you have disposable income. You've given your, the government of your taxes $750 a month for 12 months, which equals about $9,000. And you're giving it to them interest-free. If you get a refund at the end, it's your money. You don't get any interest on that money. And so I always used to tell people about the definition of interest. Do you know what the definition of interest is, Roger? Um, I don't know that I know the one you're searching for. How about that? Okay. I'm going to tell you a story. There was a man by the name of Tom Perry. Um, brilliant. In fact, he died just a few months ago, huh. a little older. But when he was younger, he went and got his MBA. The first job that he got was with a bank in Boston. He was called in by the president the first day that he got there, introduced to him. They sat down and, and, and exchanged pleasantries. In the middle of their discussion, the president said, now remember this, this is a bank's definition. The president said, Tom, can you tell me the definition of interest? Well, Tom's trying to figure out what this definition of is. He's trying to show him how smart he is because he just got his MBA and just got out of college, right? While he was trying to come up with the book definition, the bank president said, remember this, interest is to them who understands it, them who gets it, them who don't understand it, them who pays it. If you don't understand what interest is, you're going to lose. Now, how does a business pay its income tax? Let's say it earns the same amount of revenue, $5,000.
but it does not take its taxes off the top. The first thing it does is pays its expenses. And then it has operating cash left over. Now, if you look at that, it's got more operating cash left over with the same amount of income and the same amount of expenses as you as an individual would have. And let's assume that it's a, a, a corporation, an average tax bracket of about 30%. That means that 30%, which is double the individual at 15%, you're paying $150 less in taxes every because you're a business and you're, you're authorized to do that. Now, the one trick is, is we want to see if you can't legally and ethically transfer your fixed expenses to a business and make them business expenses. And there are many expenses that can legally pay, be paid by your business. So let's transfer them. Here's some of the interesting things that you can get your business to take care of legally and ethically. And if you want, at the end, we'll offer you and make another offer. We have a newsletter that states this and shows you what things can be done. First off, you realize that your, your uh, business can pay your entire house payment and can pay your rent if you do it right. It can also pay all your house office maintenance. So instead of having just a location there at your home that you're calling a, a, a home office expense or home office deduction with the IRS, it can actually pay for almost entirely your, all your house and its, and its maintenance. It also could pay for all your utilities. It can pay for all your auto expenses, the gas, the tire, the oils, the repairs, and it can pay for the auto interest. Because if you're buying interest on time and you have to pay that interest, that's not deductible to you. But if the business pays for an auto interest, it gets to deduct the interest. It also can deduct credit card interest, which is not a deduction to you. Add in employment taxes. If you're organized properly, you can reduce your self-employment tax wages versus a contractor and you can get depreciation now we've gone through the tax end of it let's talk about the protection end i want to protect myself from the cold cruel world i don't want somebody to take things that i have and i'm going to use the analogy of going skiing if you see this picture here what do you see do you see the individual now, my, uh, my au natural, my, my face, my skin, that's me. And luckily for you and everybody else, I'm, it's covered for the most part. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay, but I don't want anybody to see even my hands and my face that are not covered. So while I'm out skiing, I put on a thermal layer. I put on a warm shirts and jeans and heavy socks and snowsuit and, and good boots and on my outside, I've got a, a big, nice parka, gloves, mask, and goggles. If, Roger, if you were to see me on the mountains like that, would you see me? No. What would you see? A blur as you race down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and actually, you would actually see the outside covering. Okay. Because I don't race the, down the hill that fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's say that you see me on the hill. And let's say that I fall down the hill and I rip my jacket and all of a sudden the cold cruel world is penetrating again. Now what do I do? I don't have time really to, to uh, go out and repair it and repairing it would still not do just as good. So the best thing to do is I'm going to take the jacket off and I'm going to throw it away and I'm going to start all over again. The reason for that is it's the outside that took the hit not the underneath layers. You want to build your sa the business the same way. So we propose, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, you want to keep it simple. See the bottom of that? All for you or one for you. You need to know the differences between the organizations. And remember this, the KISS principle. Now, my wife hates it when I call somebody stupid, right? But I don't care. Keep it simple, stupid. You can right? say keep it simple, silly, okay, and it's, <laughs> it's not as jarring, but All I right. get you. I well, my you. wife says the same thing, hence I know the word silly now. Oh, well, I, my son-in-law's name is Sam, so we always used to keep, say keep it simple, Sam. Keep it simple, Sam. Okay, but look at the very bottom. Easy in, easy out. I bought that jacket. It got ruined. I tossed it and bought another one. Easy in, easy out. It had no 
real meaning to me except for protection. So how to protect yourself? What do you use? C corporation, S corporation, limited liability company, general partnership, limited partnership, sole proprietorship, or a family trust? Or do you use them all? How do you use the one that's best? Okay, so let's start with a C corporation and an S corporation, right? A C corporation, the C stands for classic. Classic means it's been around forever. And that's why it's got the C on it. Everybody knows what a corporation is. Everybody knows that a corporation can protect yourself. Or do you change it into an S corporation? C corporations and S corporations are organized exactly the same. The only difference is the S corporation has been given a different tax status by the IRS, is recognized as a different type of taxable organization. Now, the difference is taxes. It's all about taxes. Double taxation is the biggest key. Doug, are you familiar with double taxation? Yes, I am, Ron. Okay, can you explain it just a little bit? Uh, basically, a corporation, Possible to pay its own taxes on its net profits. It also gives dividends to the shareholders who are also responsible to pay income on those, on, excuse me, taxes on that income as well on the personal level. They're being taxed twice, once in the business and then once personally. And that's considered a C corporation. So an S corporation, Marvin, you understand the difference, right? Marvin, are you there? Can you hear me? Oh, now I can hear you. There we go. So do you want to take a minute and explain what an S corporation difference is? A C corporation is its own entity. It pays its own taxes. An S corporation is a flow through entity where the profits flow through to the owners. Right. So who pays the taxes? The owners. That's correct. The shareholders. But C corporations and S corporations both have to start out as C corporations have to be organized exactly the same way. So there are requirements for maintaining a corporate status whether you're a C corporation or an S corporation. The status is first off you have to have shareholders and a corporation must issue stock certificates even with an S corporation. The shareholders elect the board of directors. The policies and procedures of the company are set by the board of directors. The board acts according to bylaws, which they have approved. And the board of directors then elects the officers. And we recommend that you have three directors. And there's a reason for that. After the officers are directed, are elected, they manage the company. And we consider that you ought to have two, a president and a secretary. I recommend, and the, and the company recommends, that you have three directors, a chairman, and two board members, and the president and the secretary be the same persons that act as the other board members on the board of directors. So really, in the corporation, you only have three individuals, a chairman, and president, and a secretary, all of whom are also board members. Now, one of the things you gotta do is not act as an alter ego. I talked to a man yesterday um, who has a corporation, set it up by himself, and I said, have you, uh, do you have stockholders? He said, yes. I said, okay. Who's the stockholder? He says, I am. I said, that's interesting. All right. Um, have you given him any stock certificates? The, he said, no, I haven't issued any stock certificates. Okay. Who's the chairman of the board? I am. Uh, who elected you? Oh, nobody elected me. I just appointed myself. Well, that's interesting. Who's the president of the company? I am. And who elected you? Nobody elected me. I just appointed myself. That's an alter ego. You're just acting like an extension. I had an attorney once tell me that there are 13 ways to pierce the corporate veil. You cannot act as an alter ego without somebody saying you're not really a corporation no matter what you say you are not a corporation or an LLC or any other formally organized company because you don't act like a business. All you're doing is acting like you under a different name. 
and they'll take everything that you have personally as well as what the corporation owns. You've got to have regular meetings of the board and the shareholders. You've got to keep minutes. You've got to issue the proper notices. You've got to follow the legal protocols. Now, let's talk about two other ones, or one other one real quick, which is the limited liability company. A limited liability company can be good for entrepreneurs if you're organized properly. So let's talk about the requirements. The owners, there's members are the owners. They're not shareholders. They own a share of the company. You don't have to issue stock certificates. You can if you want to. It's not legally required. A single member LLC is one member. And one member does, in a way, get some sort of protection. And I asked another attorney about this once, and he said, yeah, they can get some protection from personal liability, but if I sue that company, I'll take that entire company. So you lose your company if you're a single member LLC. If you're a multi-member LLC, you're not going to have to worry about that as much because now you've got more than one owner, and if they were to sue one owner, the other owner could still own part of the company. So they couldn't take the whole company unless they sued both and owners individually. Whatever you own can be taken in a lawsuit. And I have another form that I will give to you if you're interested at the end of this session, where I will send you a, a questionnaire. Well, not a questionnaire really, it's a, it's a bunch of statement of facts, but it says, are you sue worthy? Are you protected? Now, the IRS considers the single member LLC as a disregarded entity. I also have an IRS statement that shows that exactly correct. And a, a single member LLC can be elected to be taxed as a, a corporation, either C or S, or as a sole proprietorship. Usually in default, the IRS will take you as a sole proprietorship if you're a single member LLC. If you're a multi-member LLC, you can also be taxed as a corporation if you want, but most often, most multi-member LLCs are partnerships. Is that correct, Doug? Yes, correct, Ron. Okay. Now, who pays the tax in a limited liability company? The LLC does not pay tax. It forms out a information tax return, and it submits that to the IRS showing who the owners are. If you're a one-owner LLC, you pay the tax. You file it on your own tax return for the most part. If you're a multi-member LLC, all the owners pay the tax if there's a profit. And it's based on ownership, which is outlined in part of what we call an operating agreement, it's like a partnership contract. Now, let's talk about two other ones that we're just gonna barely to touch on them. One is a general partnership, and the other one is a limited partnership. I went to a class once taught by a very wealthy, well-known real estate guru, um, and he and I were quite good friends. I knew him quite well. And uh, he said, Ron, you need to come to my class. And I said, okay, why do I need to do that? And he said, I'm gonna show you that a limited partnership is the best class, best type of organization. I said, okay, I went to the class. When I got through, I said, um, you need to come to my class. And he says, why is that? And I said, because I'm gonna show you that a limited partnership is not the best vehicle. The limited liability company is a much better vehicle. General partnerships and limited partnerships are organized in such a fact that both of them have to have general partners, which means that they're the ones that operate the company. General partner means that if Roger and I went into business together and we didn't formally organize ourselves, we just signed a partnership agreement, we could both operate the company, we're both equally and severally responsible for every debt for that company. And if somebody were to sue us, they could take that company. Plus the fact, if I went out and borrowed $10,000 against the partnership and skipped town, who would have to pay the $10,000? You're the partner. You, if you're my partner. Yep. I'll try not to do that to you. No, don't do that to you. Okay, a limited partnership is a different vehicle. It also has a general partner which assumes all the risk. The limited partners, are the ones that put the money into it, do the investment into it, and they get back a passive income. So their tax deductions are um, limited based on what they have invested in the company, based on based on how many uh, 
deductions has been taken by that partnership, but it's limited based on the national Have anything further to add to that, Doug? No, Ron, you're doing a good job. Thank you. All right, so now let's go into one other one, which is a sole proprietorship. A sole proprietor is a one person owner and anybody that's legal can own it. Remember this, you of yourself are as legal as a corporation. You are your own corporation. And, a, and you are the, you can have a limited liability company that owns a sole proprietorship. You can have a corporation that owns a sole proprietorship. A sole proprietorship though, who assumes the risk? Roger? You're the sole proprietor. Yeah, the owner assumes all the risk of the business, right? Now, let's talk about one other area, family trust. Let's talk about two different types of trust, and that's the only kind that we deal with. One's called a revocable or living trust. The other one is a re ir irrevocable trust. A living trust or an a revocable trust is fluid, can be changed, can be fixed. Uh, the grantors, and I'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but they can go in and make changes to the beneficiaries, the terms of the trust, the trustees. They can take assets in and out of the trust. It's a great vehicle for tax planning. It's a great vehicle for estate planning because if you only have a will, a will has to be probated. You've got to go in front of a judge. A judge is going to cost the attorney's fees for your survivors. If you have a trust with what we call a pour over will, which means that it says, if I die before I transfer any of the rest of my remaining assets into the trust, everything that's left over goes into the trust if I haven't already given it to somebody else. Automatically, you avoid probate and you avoid estate taxes because you have not changed the owner. But a revocable trust can be fixed, can be changed, and anybody that would sue you personally could come back to you and say, well, because you have control over the assets, they're your assets and I'm gonna take them. I've seen it done, it's called busting the trust. I've seen it many times. Irrevocable trusts, on the other hand, are set in stone. Once it's done, it's done, the grantor walks away with it. And it doesn't come back, it doesn't do anything with it. The trustee is in charge. So now, the three parties to a trust, of both types of trusts, are the grantors or trustors. They dictate the terms of the trust. They prepare the trust document. They name the trustees. They make the, the, the beneficiaries. They name the beneficiaries. The, they're the reason that everything is put together. And then they fund the trust, which means they transfer assets, money or hard assets, into the trust. Once that's done, and an irrevocable trust, you walk away from it. Once it's done, if it's a living trust or a revocable trust, you're still in charge of everything. Then the trustee manages the trust according to the trust document and the beneficiaries get to receive the benefits of the trust. So now let's go back to our first question. How do you own nothing and control everything? What is it? It's all in the eye of the beholder. You do it because you control what the outside public sees. They didn't have to see everything, they didn't have to see all of those things. You dictate what you want other people to see. This is how I suggest it be done, okay? First off, a company is working with the public. That's your nemesis. It's got a two-edged sword. It's gonna pay you money for services, but if it doesn't like what you do, it's gonna sue you. In a C corporation, or an S corporation, you are the chairman of the board. You, the business owner, become the chairman of the board. You have two board members, which are also the two officers of the company. Who's the owner? The family trust. The family trust is the only owner of the company. An S corporation, on the other hand, cannot own, cannot be owned by a trust. Only specific trust, but these two types of trust, they cannot do that, okay? A tr an S corporation has to be normally owned by a warm living body. Then you have a limited liability company. Now, the limited liability company does not work with the public. It contracts solely with the C corporation to provide services and it owns all the assets and it leases those assets to the C corporation. Who owns that? You, the business owner and your spouse or your family trust. That's why you got both arrows in there. 
In my case, my family trust and my spouse own the limited liability company. And the one thing that you need to understand here is that a C corporation before you start business requires that you have at least a thousand dollars in asset. We want you to make some profit. We want you to pay some taxes. We want you to keep the IRS happy. But you can't start until you have a thousand dollars in assets. And let's say that it owns only a small amount of, of assets. If somebody sues the C corporation, what can it take? Only what it has. Only what the C corporation has. That's exactly correct. So it has a thousand dollars in there. That's a thousand dollars. Then what do you do with it? There's your outside jacket. What do you do with it if somebody takes it and, and cuts it up in ribbons? Throw it away and get it. That's exactly correct. And why do you do that? Because the le the assets are loaned by the limited liability company underneath. They're a leasing company. So if the C corporation goes away, the LLC takes the assets back. You form another one and release it to the new organization. Now, after that, you have the sole proprietor. And the sole proprietor, in my case, is me. I'm a sole proprietor. I manage a limited liability company. I do work for the C corporation, but I don't get paid by the C corporation. Right? And who owns it? You do. You're the sole proprietor. So you bill the limited liability company for your services. They pay you for your services. So, in conclusion, Remember this, not all cases are the same. Each family situation has got to be planned separately. So whether it's one of the assets or one of the organizations or all is entirely up to you based on your need at the time. But build yourself a good foundation from which you can grow and it still will protect you where you're at. And as you need more protection, you add more layers. The colder it gets, the more you layer, right? That's right. Now, as we told you that throughout this thing, we will provide for you free of charge a letter with IRS references that show what we taught today. That'll show that we don't just make this stuff up, that it is actually allowed by the IRS. So contact us. There's the, the website. Go in and contact us. On the website, it has a telephone number, and it also has an email address not just an address but a form that you can email us and we'll respond to that i'll send you all of the letters that you ever require if you've got questions on these things we'll send them to you we'll talk to you we'll, we'll help you out we do not charge for telephone calls now i'm going to end the story are you ready you've got another one are you ready i'm ready doug i think you've heard this one before i don't think marvin has though <laughs> yes i have heard this one have you <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there was an old farmer. He had uh, been given a, a farm that had been handed down from father to son for generations. He was getting old, he had nobody to hand the farm down to, and so he started cleaning up the mess. <coughs> the problem of it was, he has an old well and an old donkey. He couldn't get rid of either one of them, and he kind of wondered how he could do that. So the first thing that he did was, he started trying to sell the donkey and he couldn't do it. Well, one day, the donkey fell into the well. And when it fell into the well, boy, it put up a fuss. And the old farmer said to himself, you know, that's really good. Why don't we just take care of both problems right at the same time? So he called all of his neighbors in, handed them shovels, and they started throwing dirt into the well. well. The donkey was old, but he wasn't stupid. He knew exactly what was happening. And he really put up a fuss, kicking the walls of the well and braying, and, and all of a sudden he quit. And it was really soon after he quit. And the farmer said to himself, this can't be right. He can't be dead already. Looked into the well, there's the donkey. Every shovel full of dirt that went in and landed on him, the donkey would shake the dirt off and step up. Another shovel full went in, he'd shake the dirt off, step up. Pretty soon after a couple of hours of doing that, the donkey walked out of the well. Moral of the story, life's gonna throw dirt on you, shake it off and step up. But Got another moral. Uh oh. Got another one. Ready? I told you that donkey was old, but he wasn't stupid. He knew exactly what that farmer was doing. He sought that farmer out and bit him in the backside as hard as he could bite him. The bite became infected and the old farmer died. <laughs> right? And the moral of this and, is? Yeah. The moral story is if you make a mistake and try to cover your ass, it's going to come back to bite you every time. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> so that's wonderful, Ron. I, I found this very, very interesting. I everyone listening in was intrigued by the thought process that you had as to protecting your assets and building all this. So I've got a few questions. I'm going to start with Doug and then go to Marvin and then come back to you. And so, Doug, you're looking at this obviously from an accounting point of view. What other insights would you bring to this as to these layers that Ron's been describing? As, as far as protecting your business? Yes, from an accountant's point of view. I'm just curious what, what other thoughts you might bring to the table here. I mean, it's important that you, know, you separate the, the personal from the business. And what, what he's explained today is that you, it's important to be organized and to keep them separate. And also, to, you know, like Ron says, if you're not organized, um, the IRS will, can, come over, can come after you and disallow a lot of expenses. And so like he was saying, you have to be organized. And that's the first thing when people start a business, they have to get a separate checking account, you know, to get the organization right. So if you're talking to a person that is in business and has been in business and they just got their company and some employees and they have some assets, maybe for some products that they produce and so forth, what, what advice would you give them that would encourage them to reach out and go to the website and start this process? What advice would you give them? The advice, you know, being a business for yourself, it's a, it's a, you know, high, a high risk proposition. And so you have to protect yourself. And so, you know, if you're just out there doing things on your own without really getting educated, you know, you're at a higher risk of, of you know getting getting an audit or getting something happening so I would encourage you to get the help you need and, and be humble enough to ask for help very good and Marvin obviously you're looking at it from a tax perspective I'm just kind of curious what other insights might you want to add to this discussion you don't protect yourself the IRS can come after you and take all of your assets if you cover yourself and have an answer for every um, deduction you have, then you're, you're covered. So having these layers also helps you uh, have answers for why do you have this expense. Gotcha. Well, Ron, I think this has been a wonderful uh, presentation only because I think most business owners get into business because they're good at what they do and they do what they do uh, business-wise as a default. Uh, they're, they're, they're more eager to get their product and service out to the market, to the public, and, and taking care of them. And sometimes I think they just neglect how well they're organized and protected like you're bringing up here today. So two questions that I would like to have for you as we're concluding. One, let's assume I contacted you here at your website and reached out. How long of a process is it to take what I may already have and create the structure as you described it? How much time and effort does that really take? Well, the first step would be for me to do an interview. Huh? I do know where you're at. Right? If you're a startup business, you keep it simple. Remember the KISS principle again. That's really important. And you, and you form a good foundation. If you've been going for a while, take a look at things. I, I took on a client the other day, for instance, that's been going for years. And he did all of his own work. He, he did his trust. In fact, he has three trusts all intertwined with each other. And um, he has a, a, a motel or a hotel, a big hotel that he owns in Tennessee. His wife owns a finance company. So he's got three organizations already set up, a C Corporation, a couple of LLCs. But he was not taking advantage of the best tax benefits because they were not working with each other. They were all separate. Mm -hmm. And so I went in and took a look at him and we just kind of did a real simple reorganization, formed one other LLC and he didn't have a poor over will. So we got a poor over will for him. And, and now he's saving money. In fact, I think last year he saved $36,000 on his taxes that he hadn't been able to do before. Yeah. That's wonderful. So again, time-wise, you're saying it, it starts with the conversation with you. And it'll take about maybe an hour for me to go in and visit with them. And then they can decide which way they want to go from that point. And I don't charge anybody. In fact, I don't think Doug does either. We, we're willing to help people get home properly. We will not charge them for an initial visit. Is that correct, Doug? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. 
Well, one, I thank you for all of your time. Obviously, I think this is an intriguing conversation that every business owner needs to consider. There's a philosophy. It's working on your business, not just in your business. And I think this is an intelligent way to step back and look at how you can work on your business and really have your business work for you. One of the things we teach at Universal Accounting as as we work with our clients is you need to see your business as a living, breathing, separate entity. And as such, I think you're able to then let it basically grow and develop as it should and basically work beyond you, grow the, beyond you. And the IRS wants to see it as a living, breathing, separate entity. Yes, it does. It doesn't want it to be part of you at all. You've got to realize that your business and you are two separate legal entities. And the business has to treat you the same way that it would treat me. Excellent. Well, I appreciate everybody for your time and for listening in. I definitely encourage you to reach out, go to the website shown there and basically get a chance to speak with Ron as to how you with your business can actually be more proactive as to how you're organized and take advantage of some of the opportunities out there as to the legal structures that you could uh, be as and, and so forth. So thank you for your time and Doug, Marvin, Ron, thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you.